Hi, Hope Community Church. Hope you're all are doing well. And by the way, happy Easter. Just hoping that you're having a, a, a great uh, celebration with your family, being able to just rejoice over the fact that Christ is risen. And because he has, we have new life. We have eternal life with him. Just a great day for the church. Today we're going to continue to look at... Um, the book of Acts, and today we're going to look at chapter 12. Well, I hope you've been encouraged and, 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 and strengthened by the, the messages that have been given to us, the thoughts that people have shared through their time of reading through Acts. This has just been, the, the book of Acts has so many stories in it that are there to enlighten us, to encourage us, to strengthen us in our faith. And we look, just looked in chapter 9 where Saul was converted we see in chapter 10 where, where God grabbed a hold of Peter and showed him very vividly that the gospel was to be for the Gentile world as well as Cornelius and his family came to know Christ and, and how he then went in chapter 11 and shared with the council of Jerusalem and that they realized it's like the light came on for the church that yes, the gospel is for the Gentiles. Man, we come up to this point and the church is just having so many victories. They're, really, they're on a hot streak. But then when we come to chapter 12, we see some hardship. And um, just wondering, how is a church going to deal with the hardships in chapter 12? Well, let's, let's read what it says here in chapter 12 and, and see uh, how the church responds. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. Now, this King Herod is the grandson of the Herod who was spoken to us of in Scripture during the time of Jesus' birth. So just, just so you know that, that this King Herod is the grandson of that Herod. And it says here, he arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to per persecute them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Now, here's a first. Here's the first time that an apostle of Christ has been martyred. Now, we know Stephen was martyred, but this is the first apostle that was martyred. Maybe up to this point, many people thought that the apostles were untouchable, and they probably were. I mean, there's a sense of God's protection for them. But we also know that many of the apostles were going to be martyred. And in fact, James had asked if he could have a special place, a special seat in Jesus' ministry. We look in Matthew chapter 20, and Jesus says, Are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink from? And James says, Yes, yes, I'm able. And Jesus told him, Well, you will drink the cup. You will die just as I died. You will be martyred. And it says here that James, the brother of John, was put to death with the sword, which is many believe that he was beheaded. And it says here that when he saw that this pleased, that is Herod, saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers. That's 16, I believe, if I know my math. Sixteen people were guarding him, and Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison. The church was earnestly praying for God for him. And that night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. I'm kind of wondering why there's so many guards were guarding Peter. If I remember back in Acts chapter 5, well, Peter was arrested and and God had allowed him to slip out of that. So I'm thinking Herod was thinking, there's no way I'm going to let Peter out of, out of jail. We're going to guard him. We're going to super guard him and have all these people in the chains and so forth and so on so that he doesn't escape. But then in verse 7 it says, Suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up! Now, I don't, it says he struck him on the side. Maybe Peter was a, a really deep sleeper. I don't know, but it says here he struck him. He says, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. And he says, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And Peter followed. Followed him right out of the prison. Boy, this is a different type Peter. This is a different Peter than what we read in the Gospels where he was 
you know, arrogant and saying he was going to do all these things but yet deny Christ. This, this is a different Peter. You can see it here in this passage. And Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. And they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him and left Peter alone. Then Peter came to himself. He woke up, and he realized it wasn't a dream. He says, now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating, which I think Peter was thinking as he was in the jail cell that he was, that he was going to die, which really talks about his faithfulness. You know, he, he, it says here he was in a deep sleep, really. He was sleeping soundly in the jail, not worried, not, not you know, wringing his hands, not fearful of what the future is. He was sleeping. And then in verse 12, it says, when this had dawned, when this dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. They were still earnestly praying. And Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. What are you talking about? When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. But Peter, Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter mentioned with, motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and, be, and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said. Obviously not the same James that was martyred, but the probably Jesus' brother. And he said, and then he left for another place. And in the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers. They were all wondering what happened to Peter. Herod had those soldiers put to death because they allowed Peter to escape. And then it says here, Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while, and he had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. And having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personnel, personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. And here in verse 21 it says, And on that appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. And they shouted, This, is, this man is, is, is not a normal man. In fact, he's a god. And, well, God was going to take care of this rather quickly because it says immediately after that that God struck Herod. He struck him down and that, and that he was eaten by worms and died. But then verse, the last two verses in, in this Acts chapter 12, it says this, And be encouraged. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. And when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with him John also called the mark. You know, when I read this, there's so many things in this chapter that we could touch on, so many teaching points, but the thing that struck me the most was this, this, this idea of prayer and the power of prayer. It says here in verse 6 that, uh, in fact, in verse 5, that the people were earnestly praying for Peter. It was just this idea that they were constantly praying for him with a lot of energy. In fact, it has this idea of stretching for something for all it's worth to try to get it. They were in this, this incredible state of prayer. In fact, it's the same type of prayer that Jesus described about himself when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was that type of prayer, the energy that they were, that they were involved in when they were praying for Peter. It even says in verse 12 that they were when when Paul came to the house that they were still praying but interesting when when Rhoda came to them and said hey Peter's at the front door they didn't respond with whoa God answers prayer wow really quick I mean I couldn't believe that God answered that prayer so quickly but no what was their response their response was ah, get out of here there's no way Almost this idea that there's no way God could answer this prayer this quick. I mean, come on. And I, sometimes I wonder about our own prayer life, my own prayer life. Sometimes I can go through the emotions of praying. Sometimes those emotions, hey, 
God calls me to pray. And I want to be a man of prayer. And sometimes my motivation for prayer is not so much my concern for others and my concern for what God wants to do, but it's like this, sometimes it can become a mechanical exercise rather than being an intimate relationship with Christ. It made me really think about my prayer life again. That do I earnestly pray and do I really believe that God is going to answer prayer? He, he does. God is still a God who answers prayer and there's still power in prayer. And you know, there's one other thing that I noticed in this chapter as well, was that the obstacles that can get in our way when we, when we try to do ministry. I mean, look at all the obstacles that were in Peter's way. He was in jail. He was chained. He had uh, soldiers all around him. He had Herod. All these obstacles that were, that were in his way. So, so to speak. But you know what? None of those things can stand up to God. Not even our unbelief, as it says, that these people had in this chapter in reference to when they saw Peter and said, no, there's no way. See, even in our unbelief, God continues to work. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. And I'm not saying that God's going to do exactly the same thing for us here at Hope. But I will say that God has planned for us to do extraordinary things. Just as he called the church to do extraordinary things in Acts chapter 12 and throughout this whole book of Acts, God still wants to do extraordinary things in our church. We just need to keep earnestly and constantly seeking him and trusting and believing in him. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. Continue to go out and be the church. Peace.